yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, we may lose it again, but I'll we'll see. <laughs> okay, so this one is uh, part eight, Revelation thirteen. A uh, sorry, thirty. That should be thirteen B. Sorry, not thirteen A. Thirteen B uh, to uh, end of chapter fourteen. So it's the second half of chapter thirteen. And uh, great that that song, that last song, ended uh, on eternity. Uh, and that's what we're really talking about today. Um, so really heavy subjects here about things that certain people don't believe, even people who say they're Christian don't really accept. And, and it's very hard to accept some of these issues I'm going to talk about. But um, we always have to remind ourselves that we are in the presence of a God who is right all the time, who has authority over all things and is perfect in justice. Uh, so we must, we must always remember that as we go through verses like these. Um, let me just go back. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about here is, is about the second beast coming out of the earth. We've looked at the beast coming out of the sea, and now this is the beast coming out of the earth. Uh, and then we're going to look at the three angels. So again, controversial uh, subject matter in what people think are the angels and not the angels and all this stuff. So it's really interesting just to get into it and to understand what it might look like. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, Revelation 13, 11 to 14 uh, first. Uh, and it goes like this. Um, that's, that's halfway in. I don't know why I've missed a verse there, haven't I? There we go. Then I saw a second beast uh, coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all authority of the first beast on its behalf. Uh, um, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed and it performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast it deceived the inhabitants of the earth it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived okay Let's have a look at these first few verses. So the next beast we see is the one that emerges from the earth and is a combination in its description of a lamb, a lamb and a dragon. And we can assume this to be an agent of the dragon, who is Satan. And so it's likely to be a man. And this is a second man. This is another man, as it were. Uh, he will work on behalf of Satan. Uh, and the miracles he will perform will be by the power of Satan himself. As we look at this, uh, I need to say that there is a consistent sign uh, of these times. Um, and, uh, and when we look at this, these are not events that we are experiencing today. And I need to remind us that what we see here is not what you might see in a uh, COVID virus or a vaccination. I'm telling you, it's a different ball game. It's entirely different to what you see here um, because you're going to keep getting that. And it, it will get worse, I think. Rumours and rumours of wars, as Jesus warned, uh, it will come and people will keep trying to say, this is it now. But what do we know as Christians? We know that no one knows when the time has come except the Father. And that's who we have faith in. It's not that we have faith in man to work it out because we won't know until it happens, until the Father deems it right for these events to take place. But the reason why these events that we see have no relation uh, in, in Revelation is because we need to have a crucial event happen. That is that we will see a reason for the whole earth to worship one person. And it, and it won't be hidden. It will be very showy. It will be very obvious. And that person will gain such worship due to the use of, uh, due to the use of a fatal wound being healed. They will, they will look like a miracle worker. Not like rumours you hear, whatever, on social media of people doing... Uh, certain miracles, so-called miracles, whatever you want to call it, this is one that will be seen around the world and everyone will absolutely latch on to. The, the whole earth, it says, will absolutely be drawn to this person. In other words, like I said last week, the earth will be obsessed with this person to the point of worship. Not just a few people, the whole earth. Those that are not in Jesus will be obsessed with them to the point of worship. There was an interesting point made uh, in the talks uh, in COP26 uh, as they try to look at ways to reduce the damage, the pollution to our planet. 
Uh, and one news item, I think I remember seeing it on the news somewhere at least, uh, and, and this was a person saying, you know, they need to kind of be more bold uh, in, in coming up with policies and, and what they need to do uh, to, re to heal the planet, as it were. They said, wouldn't this be a perfect moment for some narcissist to stand up and really go for it? You know, really put down some policies that they're going to do all this and that. They're going to uh, stop using harmful petrols and fuels, whatever, and, they're, uh, and they carry it out. Wouldn't this be a great time for a narcissist to come up and really claim victory and claim glory for themselves? Uh, because no one seemingly really stood up. They, they, they were all talking, but there was no real person that would take uh, credit for it, as it were. But these, this is one of those moments where the world is watching. And you think, this, this is similar. It's not in COP26, by the way. That's not where we see revelation happening. Uh, but it's a similar situation where the eyes of the world will be on an event of some sort or, or where things are happening. And then someone will step up and look like Jesus. They will look like someone who will bring salvation, as it were, a version, a false version of salvation, a false version of peace. In these talks, leader could, a leader could have made some real bold policies, changed the way of our life as we know it at the moment, and then at the same time take this huge credit and receive levels of ad admiration from around the world, possibly not seen before, receiving a sense of sort of worship. And that's what we're going to see here. We're going to see this event that will take place and people will uh, fall in adoration almost to this person. So again, it's not hidden. It's going to be very obvious. It's going to be like nothing you have seen. It says many parts of Revelation uh, that we've read already. But this second man that we read about will garner such praise and attention that the world will hang on his every word and action. But there is one particular noticeable fact about this second man. He will only be able to perform these miracles in the presence of the Antichrist. The noticeable difference here is so we can distinguish between the real God and the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the devil, cannot be omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere, so he can only be in one place at once. Satan is in the form of the Antichrist, the first man that we read about last week. So again, Satan can only be where the Antichrist is. So all that attention will be focused only where he goes, only where he is present. So Satan has to be watching the false prophet in order to know what he is doing. When he isn't present in a particular place, as we read in our verses, the image will serve to keep people reminded when he is not present. You see how it works? So if the, if the person themselves is not present, it's okay because they'll create this image of worship and then that will keep people reminded of this person, of whoever this person is. And so he doesn't have to be omnipresent because he'll have all these images everywhere, trample, it says, over God's temple, and he will make these signs and images everywhere to remind people of who he is. Again, it's going to be quite obvious, especially so to Christians probably hardly not at all to non-Christians. This form of statue and image building is consistent, I think, in human history. Uh, we've got many statues here in this country, around the world. Don't we just love building images and statues of things, of people, and we honour them and we, we love them and we put them up on a... Literally, we put them up on a pedestal. We literally put them up on a pedestal and we, there is a form of worship. But this one is going to be a statue, an image of a living person, not a dead person, a living person. That is quite unusual. But this appears, this image appears to be uh, in many places, as we will see. Uh, this, as we, we move on, it says in uh, Revelation 13, verse 15 to 18, says, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, 
great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So we come to one of those really interesting ones I've talked about a lot. What does this mark mean? What's it all about? We're going to get on to that. The false prophet will seemingly be an ambassador, this sort of roaming advocate of Satan's image, of Satan himself. Uh, some say that this might be a, a supernatural deception when they look at the image, that the image will almost look alive uh, when they look at it. So it says it gives breath to the image of the first beast. Um, and it almost looks like it's living. So it's a super supernatural image that, we're, that people are looking at. But I'm not sure that's the case. I think actually what it will be in just in reading the text is that this person will be the, 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 the living person to represent uh, this image of the beast, the beast himself. And so he will be the, the false prophet who gives breath to the image by doing his role and representing and doing the work of Satan uh, around the world, uh, certainly. Then every person, of course, it says we'll need to take a mark of the beast to buy and sell. Satan provides a counterfeit mark that we might have seen when God sealed the 144,000. Uh, every time, most times actually, the, the devil, the beast, the way he operates, he will try to mimic God every time. He will try to be the same as Jesus. He will do things like the miracle of healing his own uh, wound. He will mimic Jesus in the same way. And he will look like someone that we should worship. So Satan copies God in marking those that are his. He does the same and puts his own mark on them. Remember, he wants to be worshipped as the real God. So he will mimic the actions of God and to a point pretend to be God in his character. He even copies uh, the triune nature of God. That is that Christ is imitated by the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit is imitated by the false prophet. And the invisible father is Satan himself. Again, he's trying to mirror the setup of the Trinity, of, of, of God himself. Now, when it comes to this mark of the beast, <clears throat> the ancient word here uh, is mark, it says, uh, is, is karagma. Karagma, I think that's how you pronounce it. That's the pronunciation uh, at the bottom there. Um, uh, and that, that would suggest this is normally applied to objects, to stamping coins. So if you... Uh, still have coins, um, you will see the, the queen's head on it or whatever. You'll see marks, some sort, or even on, on notes, you will see markings, a mark on an object. And this sort of term is normally applied, <coughs> excuse me, to objects, not people. But a constant change in technology that we see in terms of how we pay for services and products today, it is probably possible, uh, a possible use and representation of what we we might see we are moving from paper coins into cards and contactless. Uh, and now there are many companies who are developing uh, implantable biochips that will monitor the health of a person. Uh, one company even said that they will be able to use that in future as a commerce, as a way to pay for products. Now listen, I'm not trying to panic you, I'm just saying that there is a route by which this might take. And it's just to be aware of these little things. What I'm not saying though, is stop using contactless. What I'm not saying is stop using uh, ways of paying with your card. Because here is an important point. It is not the thing that is the devil. The thing itself is not the problem. It is how it is used and how it is worshipped, which is the issue. So biochips aside, the use of <clears throat> contactless cards on smartphones, smart watches even, to pay for things now, is not in itself a reason to not use these things, okay? So we're not going to go into panic mode. We're going to start saying, no, we're going to go back to pound coins and pound notes, whatever you want to call it, go back. And all the way. No need for that, because that's not what this means. Whatever the mark will be, we can know from reading the Bible that the mark will honour and give glory to the thing that made it. Let me give you some verses here uh, that Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It is not money that is the problem. It is the service of it, as in the worship of it, that is the issue. 
need to get that clear. There are, there are some beliefs still going around today that they just think money on its own is, is the, we'll come on to this, the root of all evil. Money is not, it's the worship of money that is the root of all evil. Like worshiping anything else other than God is the root of evil. It is, it is worshiping something other than him, putting him, putting that above God. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's take some water here. <clears throat> so it's not money itself, which is the root of all evil. It is the love of it. In other words, it's the value we give it in our lives and place it above God that makes it evil. You know what I mean? We, we need to keep our heads here. Otherwise, we will be deceiving ourselves if we think that the objects themselves are the things that are evil. It is how they're used and if they become a form of worship and if we then love it to the point that we put, place it above the importance of uh, God himself. So the mark <clears throat> as a form of commerce, uh, in my view, I think firstly calls people to worship something that it serves. Then secondly, that love of it will cause both grief for people, but also as the love of money is the root of evil, will inevitably cause evil to be carried out. And we'll get to the end of 14 and you'll start to see, uh, uh, I have, I've had to almost tone down uh, the last part of chapter 14. It is horrific what will happen in these times. But then we move on. This is uh, verse 15. I think 15 on its own, actually, yes. It says that, uh, and we saw this, actually, just a reminder, we go back. Uh, the second beast was given the power to give breath to the image of the first beast so the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. We see this image-bearing theme with evil intent found in what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Also, Matthew 22, 17, 21, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin use of paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me be clear. The days of revelation will not be a case of giving to Satan what is Satan and giving to God what is God's. That's not what I'm saying here. It will be a choice to align with one or the other. The verse here, as I'm using it here, and I think contextually right, is used to show that money is used as a tool of worship by engraving an image on it of the person who wants the worship. Caesar wanted worship. So when we see this, when we start seeing all these images, a particularly re repeated image, money, coins, stamps on your hand, on your forehead, wherever it's going to be, Images in the temple trample all over God's temple. We start to see that's where things are starting to take place. That's where revelation is starting to open up. Now, the number 666 has a whole host of theories, too many to go into uh, in this sermon. It would probably need a whole sermon on its own, I would say. Uh, what it might mean or what it might look like. <clears throat> the Hebrew alphabet uses 22 characters, but they're not numbered 1 to 22. And I think I've got this here. Uh, so this is the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, and so there's 22 characters. There's 22 numbers in this list right here. Uh, and so each letter corresponds to each number. You say this doesn't make sense. Okay. What we know is uh, the name of 666 might belong to. What we need to know and what we'll probably find out is the Hebrew name of that person. And so what happens is we'll get to this, we'll get to the how, why this is going to be important because it says it in the verses themselves. Uh, just so you understand, if we add the Hebrew letters associated with Jesus' full name and title, Jesus the Messiah, we arrive at 749. Do you see how it makes sense? So there's, there's going to be, what I can see is three, name, three uh, words in the name maybe, but you get my point that we, we need to calculate. And actually, we're told to do this. In the verses we just read, in verse 18, it says this, Call for wisdom, let the person who is inside calculate 
the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So there will be some need to work out. Once this name is revealed, it will be calculable to show that it is 666. Now, who's going to do that? I don't know. I have no idea. Scripture doesn't say. But someone will because Revelation says so. It calls for wisdom. Let the person who is insight calculate the number of the beast. So just to give you a little insight, there's other theories that there's a Greek alphabet as well to be used in this. Uh, too many things to go into. But just to give you a kind of taste of what it might be, that's kind of a, an example of how I mean, someone or people might work out who the beast is. Let me say this, though, and go back to the core, the root of this message. In the end, what will matter is which choice you will make, that everyone will make. <clears throat> will you give your life to Jesus, or will you follow the rest of the lost and follow the beast? Let's move on. Revelation 14, 1 to 5. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. <clears throat> and I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, and a, like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like the harp of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb. Wherever he goes, they were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So John now sees the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And uh, in case you don't know, there is a mountain south of the temple, uh, the temple mount in Jerusalem called Mount Zion. Um, and now two theories are expressed in this regard as to the 144,000 and Jesus appearing with them. Um, one is that it could be Jesus on earth, or the other one is that it could be Jesus in heaven with the 144,000. There is a problem with Jesus being on earth in that he's only going to come back for the second coming. Uh, he's not just going to appear on a mountain and disappear again. Uh, and so in reading this, uh, I have tend to uh, more go towards the fact that the 144, uh, the complete number, are in heaven worshipping God with the mark on their foreheads given to them in Revelation 7. So this, in my view, is happening in heaven, uh, as, John, as John is seeing it. And they're in heaven because they've been redeemed from earth. They've been purchased, it said, from earth. They, they were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the land. No light, says, was found in their mouths. They are blameless. At the 144,000 are singing before the throne, then they are obviously in heaven, as Jesus is. Mount Zion is actually a common term in the Bible for the kingdom of Israel in glory. So it's not always literal. This is what we keep doing in Revelation. We look at parts are literal and parts are figurative, parts are examples, parts are just to try and to explain what John is seeing. So John saw the future kingdom of Israel in glory depicted in the heavenly throne room. The seal in Revelation 7 has done its job. It's done its job of protecting these 144,000 specifically, but from supernatural disasters that affect the earth, sea and trees, it says in Revelation 7. If you read Revelation 7, it was the protection was given to them to protect them from the natural disasters that was about to be unleashed onto the earth then at some point after that is a time for them to be purchased from earth during the what might be the mid-tribulation time so they could well have been martyred after the seal was done its job in serving its particular purpose in opening of that particular seal so let's move on to the three angels and this this does require a i suppose a warning because it, it gets really heavy and you need to stick with it because it, it gets incredibly gruesome towards the end of this chapter. But I'm going to explain why. Uh, and uh, again, we just need to know that God has a purpose and a reason. I'll explain some of these things. It says, uh, 6 to 13, Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the eternal gospel 
to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, fall and fall in Babylon, uh, the great which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteress. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead, or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. A lot to try and quickly unpack. unpack. Now we've come to the point where there'll be no more grace offered. Uh, this is the point where there is no more um, salvation offered. We're coming to the hour, the time uh, where no more salvation and, and salvation will certainly come to an end. It won't be offered to those who are purposefully and intentionally and fully aware, by the way, it's not accidental, fully aware of the repercussions of their decisions who have chosen to follow the beast. The angel declares that the window was closed and the hour of judgment has come. And when we look at this, this hour just really means just a short amount of time. So it's coming. The time will come when this will close the window will close so don't fear the antichrist don't fear physical death but instead fear the lord and trust him who has made all things so the gospel is proclaimed one more time in the world one last warning before the window shuts the warning of this final warning was given by jesus matthew 24 uh, verses it's going to do it again isn't it Matthew 24, verses 10 to 14. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of the most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The punishment for this is eternal and terrible. It is of burning and suffering forever. People are going to suffer without end because they are forever existing in a sinful state. And, and that should just bring it home, just how important it is that people need to know about Jesus. This, this, there's not a temporary time, there's not a... A, a little period where you're just going to be punished it is going to be forever and ever and that's a sad and horrible prospect to consider and imagine but god's judgment is called his judgment for a reason it has consequences scripture is abundantly clear about the nature and duration of eternal judgment for unbelievers and they face eternal judgment because just like us before we believed, their sinful nature itself never ceases even into eternity. So the sense now that people who don't believe still have a sense of, of consequence. Now in this place that's being described, that will come full force. It will be relentless at them. We don't suffer the consequences of that now because of grace. We suffer some consequence of sin, some impact on our lives. But when you look at sin and it's how bad and broken it makes us, when it's 100%, it will be relentless. There will be no grace in this place. Of course, the question then comes, how could a loving God punish people forever? I'm going to answer that. God has made a way for every single person 
to make a choice to come to Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior. That is the reality of the situation. People can ask, non-believers can ask all they want about why would a loving God. I can take that question apart and tell you the version of God that they have in their head is not the God in this Bible. It is a messed up version of God. It is one that they don't actually know. It is one they would prefer. I want to still do what I want selfishly and not have the consequences of my actions pay me back. That is what speaks to us as Christians who know what has come before, who know where we were and now where we are. We were in that place where we refused to bow the knee. We refused to worship God. And yet, all along, it was our choice to bow the knee and come to Jesus and be saved. If someone goes to hell, they've made that choice of themselves to follow that path. And that is sad, incredibly heartbreaking. We should not let the world soothe us by false teaching that there's an end to hell at some point. There is not. It is called hell for a reason. It is forever for a reason. It is forever. To say that hell will end at some point merely deceives the non-believer. It doesn't tell people about the truth of the word. That actually God has made a way out of that. It deceives a non-believer into a false sense of security that is not found in Scripture at all. 2 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. But there were also false prophets among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute in their greed these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping but what does god say what does the word say also for those that stand strong who are patient and endure who put their trust in jesus they will be with god forever and ever Let's continue. Revelation 14, verse 14 to 20. I looked and there before me was a white cloud. Seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold. And on his head a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come. <clears throat> For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, was, he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested another angel came out of the temple in heaven he too had a sharp sickle still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had who had the sharp sickle take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth vine because its grapes are ripe the angel swung his sickle on the earth gathered his grapes and threw them into the great winepress of god's wrath they were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' uh, bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. <coughs> this gets pretty horrible. The first thing John sees here, seated on the cloud, is he says, One like the Son of Man. Two theories, of course. One is that the first one is Jesus sitting on a cloud wall. Uh, they say because he's got a crown and he's got, he, he looks like Jesus. There's something wrong with this uh, statement, something wrong with this interpretation that it's Jesus. Uh, and I'll just tell you what that is because I've read about people saying they think they, it's Jesus, definitely, without any backing up of why they think it's Jesus. So I'm actually going to explain to you why I think it's not, uh, and I hope um, it can serve you here just to understand the context of these verses. Um, 
So either it's Jesus or either it's an angel. Uh, for me, I've concluded it, it's not Jesus, uh, but another angel who is the same. Uh, we need to consider that John says it's one like the Son of Man. And, and many others say, well, the Son of Man was Jesus. Now, but John never said when he referred to Jesus as one like the Son of Man. He called him the Son of Man. He was direct about who Jesus was. He never said it was like him, it was one like him. He said, this is Jesus. This is the Son of Man. He says, then the man has a golden crown on his head. But this word is actually a different word to the crown that Jesus actually has. The Greek word for crown is Stephanos. And this is not uh, the Greek word used for the crown worn by a king. I can't remember if I've put it up here. I haven't. Um, the, the crown used by a king is diadem. And that's what Jesus wears. We see this in uh, Revelation 19, verse 12, which we'll get to later on. His eyes are like blazing fire on his head and many crowns. That word translated is diadems. That's not the same crown, the gold crown that we're seeing here. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Then we see another angel. And the word another can only be used in relation to that which you have previously described. If you say another angel, then what you've done is you've said before that there's something already there that's like the next thing I'm talking about now. Does this make sense? In, in English language, if I say, and that's another thing, I'm talking about a thing I've previously referred to that's the same. Okay, so the text says another angel. Helpful, just to know the distinction here. Another angel. <clears throat> if it's another angel, then it must mean the first angel is an angel of, some, of the same kind. We, we knew that when it says another angel, the translation is another of the same kind, is the original translation. This angel tells the first one to reap. Often missed out by many people. I'm going I'm to say to this, I agree that Jesus is the one that decides on judgment, that God himself decides when judgment comes. I don't see how this is going to, suddenly Jesus is going to allow a second angel to tell him what to do. Does that make sense? At no point are angels allowed to tell God what to do. But the angel comes out and says, hey, you, you, Jesus, now it's time. You do it now. You reap. I, no one tells Jesus what to do. Okay? He is God. He is the one who, who does the reaping when he knows it's the right time. So when we look at this, what we're looking at is the angels doing the work of God. He's doing the work of the time of the reaping. This angel tells the first to reap, and it's really important. In my view, there's no way that Jesus is taking timing and directives from an angel. But whatever you believe, the first one is Jesus or an angel, really in the bigger picture doesn't actually matter in the context of what is going on. What we find here is that it is time for the harvest of the earth. Again, some interpret this to just be believers, uh, sorry, non-believers, other sets, both believers and non-believers. The believers taken in the first harvest and the non-believers, unrepentant sinners taken in the second and thrown into the wine press. I think when you read the text, it looks like two groups of people to me. The first one is taken and, and there's no other consequence to them. We see in the second group of people that they're taken and they're thrown in the wine press. The first one is just harvested. The second, when it says ripe, actually means an overriping that these people are overripe, uh, so fat, <laughs> bursting, whatever, whatever it looks like, it starts to overripen, and that's not a nice, necessarily a nice thing to eat. So this sense, this picture it's building up, of it's, it's ripe now, it's ready to be taken. But these overripe grapes, as description of the second group, are thrown into the wine press. The first has a different fate from the second. Then we get to the really horrible piece of the last verses in Revelation 14. A depiction of blood is one from a battle like we've never seen, with bloodshed on a scale like we will never see. The ending of Revelation 14 describes the eventual fate of the unbelieving world upon the return of Christ. 
So what did we see? So chapters 10 to 14 have taken us out of the trumpet judgments and into this amazing events of mid-tribulation. In 12 to 14, we learned that during the last three and a half years, the enemy is confined to earth. Together with the Antichrist and the false prophet, he persecutes and kills anyone who threatens his existence, particularly Christians and Jews. The Antichrist and false prophet pursue an economic police state that brings temporary sense of peace to the unbeliever, but it brings great persecution to the believers and Jews. But what I think we need to learn from these chapters today is that God's judgment is very real and very much eternal. It should remind us to be fearful of what is coming for those that chose the path of non-belief. That God's judgment and hell is not the same as putting children on the naughty step or giving them a time out for a limited period. It is a place of continued punishment. And, and you, you don't talk about this stuff in church anymore because, you know, you'll scare people off. I'm telling you, if you don't know this stuff, you, you, haven't, you haven't seen the real God of the Bible. If you can't accept the authority and true judgment of God, you need to revisit the Bible. God is righteous in his judgment. It is a place of continued punishment in the chosen path to remain in a sinful state against the holy God. But this isn't a God who is only fire and brimstone. We have the living God who inspired people to write this warning from beginning to end. But also to to offer a way out of the sinfulness of our own making. By sacrificing his own son to pay for the sin that was not his. No longer to sacrifice animals, no longer to earn our way to heaven by being good, but to accept that the sin that you were responsible for has been paid for without you needing to do anything more other than accepting that you were wrong, that I was wrong. That Jesus' death and resurrection was real and that he is the living God who wants you to be a son or daughter of the great high king himself. When you look at the two sides of the same coin and you've got offer of eternal life forever with Jesus Christ, with the triune God, and on the other side you have a choice of going to eternal hell. Once you're a Christian, the choice of choosing the, of choosing hell kind of just baffles you every day. Why would people choose that when there's eternal life and love from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? It is the invitation that is held out to every single person, no matter what anyone has done. No matter how bad you think you are and the crime you, how bad the crime you have committed, anyone can simply come and say, I was wrong, I sinned, and I want to be, I want to be a son or daughter of Jesus Christ. For as sure as God's judgment and wrath on those who do not believe is eternal, we can be equally sure that this offer of salvation through Jesus Christ is just as eternal for those that take up the offer of believing in him. Which eternity will we choose? Let's pray, uh, and then we'll have our one, one worship song, and then we'll come into communion together, uh, and then we will uh, end one last worship song uh, together. Lord, we uh, look at these passages, these chapters, uh, well, the whole book of Revelation, and um, well, we want to we want to have peace in what these times describe, in what Revelation describes, and Lord, 
we see that it will be indeed very tough for those that are still there. They're still when this takes place, this is going to be uh, horrific. But it doesn't matter, as we said last week, because actually, whether we're killed in the body or not, we're going to spend eternity with our Lord and Saviour. Lord, I pray that what, what we're not doing here is trying to scare people into faith. What, what a terrible relationship that would be if it was just about fear of hell. In fact, it is, it is the joy of a new life in Jesus, a life that is changing, changed and, and ever more changing until the time we get to you. But Lord, we, are, we need to be very real and very aware that for those who purposefully, intentionally choose to take the other path, there will be judgment and it will be forever. And that is heartbreaking. And so, Lord, I want to pray today that this message for us is a reminder of the need to always look out for these opportunities here, Lord, to keep speaking, no matter how long we've been speaking to friends, family, acquaintances, whatever, that, Lord, we're doing what we need to do in whatever way you show us to do that, big or small. It is that the gospel is heard before it's too late and way before it's too late. So that's so just like us, Lord, we can get to enjoy this life with you even as we're here on earth in this imperfect place. We'll pray, we pray that this is not about our judgment. This is all down to you, Lord. Your judgment is perfect and righteous. But Lord, we thank you that you've made a way out of hell. You've made a way out of this judgment through Jesus Christ. His blood spilt, his body broken as we will go through as we'll remember today Lord, we're going to praise your name lord and just remember just how much you've done and how little we deserve it and yet the prize is eternity with our lord and savior thank you lord that we can bow the knee and come to you and you'll accept the genuine heart you'll accept us into your family we now praise you, Lord, and thank you for Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, Father. Thank you for all these things.